All right. Uh, good afternoon or good, uh, hello, everyone, wherever time zone that you're in. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend my presentation. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to everyone about the power of crowdsourcing in a pandemic. Now, before I even get into the talk, I just want to introduce myself briefly. My name is Shrey. I'm an engineering science student at the University of Toronto. I work at the Vector Institute of Technology in the Machine Learning for Health Research Group, as well as compete for Age Group Team Canada Triathlon. If at any time you want to reach out to me after the talk, if you liked it, or even if you didn't, if you want to just connect, my contact information is, is at the bottom here. And so today I sort of roadmap what we're going to talk about. We're first going to go into the goals and motivation for this talk. We're then going to walk through sort of the story that uh, our team and I had throughout the pandemic and what we did and sort of highlighting our crowdsourcing experiences. And finally, hopefully walk away with each of you on having some key takeaways for whatever project you're pursuing next. And then we'll open it up to Q&A at the, at the end. And so to understand sort of the goals of this talk, um, I, I broke it down into three core goals. One, I want everyone to understand the power of crowdsourcing. So what exactly does it mean and how is it super valuable, especially in the setting of a pandemic like COVID-19? Uh, how did we learn how to communicate differently before the pandemic and then during the pandemic to be a successful team to sort of do what we were able to do, which I'll get into a second as well. And finally, I want to hopefully have everyone walk out with some prerequisites that they need to know before they go and do some type of data curation or crowdsourcing effort in the future as well. And so uh, to really understand our story, I want to tell you guys a bit about the motivation as well. And so to understand the motivation, we have to go back to March 2020. And this was just a crazy time for everyone, I think, especially if you're in North America right now. Uh, we didn't know too much about the virus. I know a lot of other countries were getting hit a lot harder than we were at the time. And so we didn't know too much about it. And so when my friends and I got kicked out of school because the university shut down, we had a bit more time to do stuff at home. And so we wanted to find a way that we could support Canadian public health in their COVID-19 response efforts. And so uh, we didn't know what we wanted to do, but we knew that it was going to revolve around data in some type of way, because that's where a lot of our team skills were focused around. And so what we are able to build is sort of this uh, product. And the product is really focused around syndromic surveillance. And if you don't know what syndromic surveillance is, it's OK, neither did I before the pandemic started. Uh, and for people who are in this call, to boil it down, it's essentially a survey. And it's a survey that really focuses on capturing the data uh, features of a population uh, and understanding how that population operates. And so um, these are the different types of features that we may have captured in our survey. So understanding people's symptoms, their age, their comorbidities, their sort of mental health status. And this was really important to capture for COVID-19 as it enables us to order, sort of understand a population, whether that be at the postal code level or regional level or even provincial level. And so what we ended up taking is we took all these different types of features and we were able to build a heat map from it. And the heat map is what was the most powerful part of the platform is that people would then come to our site and sort of see based on the responses from people who you know we've surveyed, how is different communities responding to COVID-19 across Canada? And this was especially valuable for public health. And so we actually partnered with the city of Montreal. We were, um, oh, whoops, sorry, little bug there. Um, that was supposed to be a screen with the city of Montreal who was one of our partners advertising for the community to go to uh, our site. And so we really focus on looking at international COVID-19 response and realize that data was a common denominator to public health efforts internationally. And this is what we really focused on capturing as much data as possible. And so throughout the pandemic, we were able to capture 450,000 forms in Canada alone from Canadians in every single postal code across the country. And so this was really valuable for public health, like the city of Montreal and other institutions to understand how are different communities responding to the pandemic, whether it be their symptoms or comorbidities or their mental health impacts as well. And so how were we able to do this? And so before I get into sort of the strategy of collecting all the surveys, I wanna tell you a bit more about why this platform was so helpful and what makes it so useful. And so let's look at the left-hand side of the screen for a second here as well. And so, for example, let's say you're an individual who's experiencing symptoms and that information needs to get relayed to public health so that they can sort of take that information and, you know, respond to it appropriately. And so traditionally, and what we're doing right now is that you as an individual, you might have symptoms, you go to a testing center, that testing center, there might be a wait for you to get that test done, but then that test gets sent to a lab where those lab results are then sent to public health and then public health reports the number of cases or, uh, or tests on a daily basis. And so that you can sort of see how there's a lot of different processes in order for that 
case number to actually get released to the public. And so there's a lot of opportunity for something to go wrong as well. But if you go to the syndromic surveillance setting, something that Flatten did is if I'm experiencing symptoms, I can report that data right away to Flatten and that data is automatically uploaded to public health within seconds. And so you can sort of see the disparities in the agility of which we're capturing data. I will highlight though, there is you know, an obvious limitation to using preclinical data, people's symptoms and comorbidities and surveying as a mechanism to you know, implement non-pharmaceutical interventions, but it is a significantly faster mechanism of understanding a population as well. And I think a lot of our data efforts in the pandemic today are focused on acute care data collection, so tests or hospitalization data, but we're not focusing on population statistics, which is especially important for these broader non-pharmaceutical interventions that we're looking at implementing as well. And so how did it all start? It really started with me messaging just a bunch of random friends. You can see this pragmatic text that I probably sent to people, if, even if we were doing a hackathon project, something similar to this. And I sent it to friends from all these different schools. And we had all these different people who were really, really excited to get to work on this project. At first, we didn't even know what we were building. But then it ended up turning into the syndromic surveillance platform. And the team was a really critical part in order for us to be able to build this scalable platform internationally. And so uh, I'll show you a brief sort of how we broke down this team to be successful as well. And so you may see some recognizable faces on the right hand side of your screen here from some of our advisors. Um, and so this team was, I think we had over 70 contributors to the platform at one point throughout the pandemic. And we took these different contributors and boiled them down into nine different sub teams. We had a software development team who was in charge of actually building the tool and the survey. And obviously these other different types of teams like translations for the different countries that we were in, a design team, a media team, a legal team, someone to actually make use and uh, analyze the data as well as you know, our team was initially just a group of first year engineering students. We didn't know anything about public health or which questions to ask. And so we needed to get the actual expertise from the medical professionals on board. When we entered into the lower middle income countries, we needed support from ethical and humanitarian expertise. Uh, and finally, business development as we needed to have some support into the vision of this organization as well. And so this was a critical part in actually making sure that we checked all the boxes when collecting data around people's comorbidities and symptoms where you need to make sure that you have the sort of support structure around you to actually collect this type of data if you ever want to make it useful for open science research in the future as well. And so we also had a bunch of different support from different communities and organizations, whether it be the city of Montreal or the European Union for where we were working in the different countries that we were. And so another really important aspect of what made Flatten so successful is the timing. And so if you're ever launching a project, it was really important for us to sort of figure out what day that we wanted to launch the tool. And, you know, I think in the pandemic, if you, any of you were working on a COVID-19 project, urgency was probably a theme that you had within your team and probably impacted the way you worked. And it was definitely for us as well. We took a very pragmatic approach to the way that we were developing our tool. And so if you look at this graph, what probably stands out to you is that on March 23rd, you see that there's 600 cases of COVID. And so you know, I think at this time we can all sort of have similar sentiments that we were really afraid of COVID. We didn't know what was going on and not that we should have any different mindset now, but we just knew so much less about the virus at that time. And so we were always, I think, I, I speak in sort of in aggregate here, looking at the news and sort of looking for more information to learn. And so we launched the tool actually on March 23rd at 7 a.m. And so this had a drastic impact on the number of people who were you know, actively checking their social media platforms and news. And uh, as we were featured on a lot of these different platforms, this is what really sparked the initial catalyst for us to gather data. And so the timing was one of the key aspects of this as well. And so we also had a ton of media. We had support from you know, notable you know, academics as well as CBC News, CTV News, National Post, and they were uh, sharing all our work and this is what really enabled us to take it from you know just a couple 10,000 surveys to hundreds of thousands of surveys that we were able to capture throughout the pandemic as well. And so this this does lead to some limitations of our approach and obviously um, we can see that here in this graph which is a logarithmic scale of our surveys over time um, you can sort of see how in March we captured almost 100,000 100, surveys in one day whereas in July we only were able to capture a couple hundred and so this is really you know, important to recognize for a public health setting is that if you're trying to analyze a population and understand how it's responding to COVID, 
being able to do this longitudinally is especially important, meaning can you analyze a patient from day A to day X and understand how their symptoms change, understand how their test results may have changed, and because our sampling was a function of the media that we were getting, it was heavily, you know, there were some limitations that we had to sort of work around to be able to capture the data that we did. And so, you know, and the media it definitely impacts the amount of data that you're getting because without the support of these different organizations, you can sort of see the drastic decrease in the amount of surveys that you're getting. And I will note that the support that you get from organizations like CTV, BlogTO, and Global Mail to share your story, provided that it actually has use to the intended communities, is significantly more valuable than any type of money or support that you would put into social media ads like Instagram ads or Facebook ads as well. Uh, and so we had a mission. Our mission was to support the COVID-19 response wherever we could. And we knew that we've built a solid mechanism of collecting data from the public in Canada, but we weren't really supporting Canadian public health in the way that we initially intended to. We wanted to sort of see and make and help them making decisions and that they could do to support Canada as a country fight this pandemic in the best way possible. And so we realized that preclinical data may not have been the way to do that in Canada because we had that sort of stronger type of data being collected, like nucleic acid-based tests, which are simply the tests that are being reported on a daily basis. And so what we focused on is how could we support communities that maybe don't have the same resources as Canada. And so we got connected with the city of Mogadishu in Somalia. And when we first connected with them, it was a really interesting story uh, and shocking, to be quite honest, because they only had one ventilator in early April for the entire country when we connected with the, uh, you know, the lead advisor to the mayor of Mogadishu. And they didn't have the resources to test at the same scale of which we are able to test here in Canada. And so how are they going to get a gauge as to how to distribute resources? And those resources are already very limited. Um, and so they had really no mechanism of actually understanding how to, to distribute any humanitarian aid or set up wash stations, uh, et cetera. And so we ended up getting connected with them and we were able to sort of take a carbon copy of what we built in Canada and implement it in Somalia. But you might be thinking, OK, there's a limitation there because what about the Internet penetration rates? And so in Canada versus Somalia, there's a 10 percent Internet penetration rate in Somalia. And so you sort of, sort of understand how that disparity is going to be significant in something like syndromic surveillance, where you're heavily depending on people listening to the news, listening to the media, and sort of getting access to the survey to contribute their data. And so we took a bit of a different approach in Somalia. We had 400 different volunteers in, in tandem with the work with the government of the city of Mogadishu, as well as support from the European Union, were able to sort of get these 400 volunteers and to be able to go and survey the public. And so still getting the public to contribute their data in some way. And over the course of 50 days, we were able to survey 100,000 people and once again, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. In Canada, we surveyed 450,000 people. Um, the Canadian government for their National Health Survey surveys around 127,000 people. So this sort of gives you some insight as to sort of the magnitude at which we're scaling at, as well as the pace at which we're scaling at and, and surveying at. As these volunteers were working eight hours a day uh, and surveying people across the city of Mogadishu uh, for a significant amount of time. Uh, and so you're able to sort of see the power of crowdsourcing because now the city of Mogadishu was actually able to make informed decisions on how to distribute resources that they weren't able to do and they were actually doing it blindly uh, before. And so this sort of public contribution of data is what enabled them to sort of respond to the pandemic in a, in a stronger way. And so now I want to take some key takeaways and sort of hopefully now reflect on it so that if any of you want to do something similar or do some type of crowdsourcing effort, um, you can sort of learn from what we did as well. And so the first thing is that it's really hard, I think, coming as from an engineering, as an engineering student, uh, I'm not used to sort of taking a datathon or a hackathon type project and building a scalable platform from it. And so, you know, traditionally in a hackathon or in other project settings, you're not actually expecting these large communities of people to actually engage with your product. But now we had so many different people contributing that we needed to build the skills necessary to be able to manage that. And so, you know, we may typically think that this sort of platform is really simple. We have a website, we have a server, and we have a database, and it's super easy. But then we sort of understand that it gets a bit more complex than that. We need to be able to connect with users, to be able to have them respond, and be able to make sure that we can manage and uh, update them on different updates that we have or submit more data. We also need to be able to make changes because we know that we did this in a very pragmatic way, and we know that there's going to be updates that we need to make. 
Uh, and we need to do analytics because the city of Montreal or other partners that we had need to sort of get some insights from this data as well. And so you can sort of see how the problems of software goes from this sort of really simple idea to it getting a lot more complex over time. And so our team, which was uh, our software team specifically, was really just a group of undergrads. And we didn't know how to really use any of these tools that you're seeing here. Um, but throughout the course of the pandemic, we leveraged all these different tools and were able to build the platform that we did. And so having a really driven team that's open to learning tools, you don't need to hire people necessarily that know every aspect of the tool that you're trying to build. But having an open minded team like that we did, we were able to learn how to use all these different tools throughout the pandemic as well. And so this is where I really wanted to focus as well uh, throughout this talk, because I think um, as we're in the pandemic now, we're realizing that the ways that we communicate are differing greatly. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we're still being effective in the way that we communicate and get things done as efficiently and effectively as possible. And so having team members on the Flatten team in London or in uh, Somalia or in, you know, in different parts of Canada and America, we had to learn how to communicate and deal with people who didn't speak English or there was a time zone barrier. And so, and also a big age, age gap barrier. We had people from high school to professors to PhDs who really ranged in age as well. And so these different demographics don't always use the same type of tools to communicate. And so we really split up our communication into two different types, external and internal communication. And so, you know, in, internally within the team, we probably leveraged some of these tools that are quite familiar with you, Slack and Zoom. Uh, and externally, we communicated in with tools like Outlook and Cisco WebEx and WhatsApp. And in fact, the Somali team, we strictly communicated with WhatsApp because it was a sort of tool that they were communicating the fastest on. If we send messages on Slack, they were just simply not check it. And so we, as a product lead, uh, we need to make sure that we were communicating in the fastest way possible as urgency was a common denominator and almost everything that we did. And so it was the product manager's role to be able to say, okay, how can I sort of get the communication between sort of the software team and the advisory team done as fast as possible? Clearly doing it over one platform wasn't working. And so we needed to sort of have this intermediary role that we were able to have between these different types of people. One of the tools that you may not see or have heard of uh, is called Gather, as you see on the bottom right. And Gather was a tool that we leveraged for the software team specifically, um, as we wanted to sort of have a feeling that we were going to work or doing something interesting on a day-to-day -day basis, given that this actually turned into a full-time sort of role throughout the summer. And so Gather is a really interesting tool for people who are working on a team and that you have your avatar and you're in this sort of fake ecosystem office. And so I had my own office and each of these other collaborators of mine had their own office. And when we wanted to communicate, you simply bring your avatar close to another one and then your video and your mic will turn on. And this sort of enabled some sort of work environment that we all sort of made the most of throughout the pandemic um, to sort of work together in the most collaborative way possible. Finally, we learned that project management is super hard. Once again, uh, as an engineering student who's managing different, you know, different levels of education of individuals, whether it be graduate students uh, or professors or a legal team, it's, it's challenging to manage a team that where you don't actually understand a lot about what they're doing as well. But we sort of leveraged some existing you know, project management tools, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar of, um, to be able to do this. And so briefly, you know, that's seeking expert advice as much as possible where we weren't knowledgeable. And so we were learning a lot throughout this process as well from our partners. Um, and we would often do check-ins with our team. How are things going? Where can I help? What is the estimated timeline such that we can hit the requirements from our partners as soon as possible? We did leverage you know, existing project management software like Jira for our software development team, which was extremely helpful. And we also did daily standups, which are again, just some sort of standard things that you may see uh, in industry as well. Um, but we also recognize, you know, we like to seek surveys and we realize how valuable they were for public health. So we wanted to do some surveys internally, especially in COVID-19 when you realize that, you know, the mental health aspects of COVID-19 is, is, is undervalued and the impact that it's having is undervalued as well. And so we wanted to make sure that we were creating as healthy of a work environment as possible for the people who are volunteering their time and working on this project. And so we actually did team surveys, psychological safety surveys and organizational leadership surveys for everyone on the team to fill in. Um, and so you can sort of see that some of the feedback that we got is that, you know, it's really easy to ask people for help, uh, but I don't really have a clear vision of the strategy for the team. And so we responded to that by having weekly standups on Tuesdays and Thursdays to go over the vision of the team, updates on the planning and have these synchronous meetings with people so that everyone sort of felt that the feedback that they were giving to leadership was actually implemented um, as well. And so 
I've gone over a lot of different things. I want to summarize in some, some context. And so if you're wanting to lead some type of data collection effort or curation effort, you can sort of see that there's three things here. We had a really big team and we had to make sure that we had the people to manage this group of 70 individuals in the most efficient way possible. We had a plan, um, but that plan wasn't always a perfectionist sort of setting. And I think this is this idea of pragmatism versus perfectionism in the startup world versus academia. In certain areas of this, we needed to be a pragmatic, take a pragmatic approach to launching the survey. We knew that urgency was of utmost priority. And so being pragmatic to get the survey out, even if there were some flaws, was okay. But in other settings, whether it came to a legal setting or you know, making sure we had ethics approval for the different types of data that we or efforts that we had, that needs to take more of a perfectionist approach because those things are things that you can't just sort of do halfway. And finally, we had a narrative, we had a mission, we had actual utility that public health was benefiting from uh, and that also the users were benefiting from. So not just, and I'm not just donating data blindly, but I'm actually getting something in return from it. And the return from it was me being able to see the heat map that tells me how my community is doing. And so these were sort of the key highlights that we had uh, that can be extended to future data efforts for other people as well. Uh, and finally, what we learned is that, you know, a lot of us coming from a, a more ML setting uh, is that we learned that machine learning is actually the easy part in this and the data curation is hard. We had three different types of surveys and we didn't know uh, much about data curation and that's really the hard part. And so, um, yeah, that's really it for today. And uh, thanks. And if you ever want to reach out, you can either email Flatten or connect with me at any time. All right. Trey, thank you so, so much for preparing such a fantastic presentation with so many helpful insights. Um, and for creating this impactful initiative, of course. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what were, what were your sources of data and was this data public? Like, was it open data? Right, so the source of data was actually the data that we were collecting. So we released a survey and then people would fill in that survey and then we would uh, collect it. The data is not currently public, but we're currently in the works of de-identifying the data and going to be releasing it to the public for open science research, hopefully within the next couple of months. Right. So there was no communication. You didn't use like the existing healthcare data or the city data that was out there. It was purely your own, like you said, your data curation. Correct. And so yeah. on the map, if we wanted to sort of highlight confirmed cases, we would obviously use you know, public health data to highlight confirmed. But anything about symptoms or comorbidities, that was using our data. Right. And the, OK, so the, and then the next, uh, sorry, the next question is, um, what were some challenges you faced along the way, especially with uh, the data curation and with analyzing the data? For sure. So I think I mentioned this in the talk that we took a very pragmatic approach to releasing these surveys. And so we had different versions of the
introduction, uh, them for half an hour. Do you, how do you want to do the transition back to you just so that it's smooth? Yeah. So because it's a live panel, are you able to talk without them hearing you? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Okay, that works. Well. Yeah, that's great. We'll we'll wait for your camera to come on to be ready for it, and your audio will come through no matter what. And once we hear you uh, kind of jump in there, we'll just switch it to you uh, main screen. Yeah, so yeah, I would say stay muted, but turn your camera on towards the end of the half an hour, and uh, we'll have it ready to go, and you can just hop in when it seems appropriate, and uh, yeah, do your, your thank yous and your outro. Okay, that works well. All right, thanks a lot. We are about three minutes from the, uh, the commence. Uh, the okay, apologies for that. Um... <laughs> Connection, but happy to continue answering questions. Yeah, so can you, um, sorry, can you just uh, pick up where you left off? We were talking about what were some challenges you faced along the way, like especially with the data curation and the analysis of the data. For sure, yeah. So I mentioned that we, we launched these surveys in a very pragmatic approach. And so that led to some significant challenges when analyzing the data, because we first launched a survey that was just seven yes or no questions that didn't actually capture anything about uh, individual patient test results or uh, understanding a patient over time and how can we analyze that you know, sample over time as well. And so when we look back now at analyzing the data, you have these three different surveys that don't align really well. And so how do you analyze how this population is progressing over time? And so that's been a really big challenge that we've now tried to focus on. Anytime we're leasing survey, we're in the hopes of that that survey will be the survey for as long as possible, such that we don't have to really worry too much about these iterative surveys that cause significant problems uh, in the analysis. And, and, and like, for example, we had certain questions that we wish we had, would have asked on day one when we had 100,000 surveys filled in that day, but we missed out on all that data and didn't realize it until April that that was valuable information to collect. Right, and actually someone just asked how long was the survey? Yeah, the survey, so it, once again, it varied in length. And so at one point it was seven yes or no questions, but then turned into about uh, two pages of questions from answering like symptoms to comorbidities, uh, all the different features I highlighted in the talk as well um, to be about, I would say about 20 questions um, in the survey. And so we have a variety of different features that we're now able to use for the later iterations of the survey that we captured. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a couple of more questions. I hope we have, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes to answer them. One is how was the quality of the data? Did you have to do any uh, cleaning or standardizing? Yes, for sure we did. And so there was, uh, it, it also really depends on the de-identification process. So if we wanna take any of this data and make it useful for open science, there's a lot of cleaning that's needed to be done uh, for these open science researchers to use it as well. And so when we look at what how the data takes in from its raw value to when it's de-identified, you miss out on a lot of different data because, for example, in rural areas, like in uh, northern Ontario, for example, you may only have two or three responses from a specific zip code. And so that becomes a significant problem because in the de-identification process, you might have to remove that postal code entirely. And so that sort of uh, is a significant limitation, especially in this in this syndromic surveillance setting, because we're missing out on those rural areas as well. Oh, awesome. And we have one more question in terms of legal. Can you elaborate if people who responded to your surveys were able to provide consent to use their data? Was there something in the survey for them to read about that? For sure, yeah. And so this was something that was really new to us as like coming as a group of, you know, undergraduate engineering students having pretty much no legal background. We didn't know what was sort of the prerequisites for us to be able to do to collect data. And so we got connected and had a legal team support us in all of these different efforts, as well as the city of Montreal supporting us and making sure that we had 
the appropriate consent, terms of use, as well as the um, data usage agreements, uh, whether we're sharing that data with other people uh, in the different types of, and making it clear to the user before they donate their data that the utility of this would be for public health and the data would be made openly available. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last question, I, I have it on my end. What's next for Flatten? Are you going to work with the city, provincial or federal government? How do you see yourself flattening the curve? <laughs> For sure. And so the next sort of things that we're focusing on is making this data openly available because we want to promote the utility of it uh, and supporting other organizations, uh, whether that be in sub-Saharan Africa and Somalia, to continue to support and collect that data as we recognize the utility of it in those settings. And so making our code openly available, which it is now as well, as well as um, being able to make this data available on different mediums, whether it be Kaggle, competition or other uh, mediums for people to use. Awesome. Well, Shrey, I wish you the best of luck. Everyone, if you haven't had the chance to check out the platform, you can go on flatten.ca. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for Shrey, maybe they can reach out to you directly if you're st sticking around for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, but thank you again for such an amazing presentation. And I really wish you the best of luck.